Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Seth. And I'm Zach. And we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. Yes, that's right. We are the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's right. That's... That's right. Welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. (laughs) That's right. Welcome to another episode of Classic... What if we just nonstop loop? Yeah, probably better than most of our episodes. Can you believe it's whatever... We don't even track episodes anymore. Can you believe it's been that long where we don't even write down episodes? 171 because 169 was duke nukem 170 was mafia uh so 171 actually people have been liking the duke nukem episode hail to the king baby that's right what if we just continue to talk about duke nukem no we should continue to talk about things that lgr is best known for that's right today's episode (laughs) these are just homages to lgr Then we'll do an episode on LGR. Yes, yeah, yeah. LGR is also a great YouTuber. Everyone should watch him. Anyway, Zach, what have you been playing recently? Seth, recently I was playing James Bond The Duel, which is a 1992 action game developed by a company called The Kremlin, which I think is a very good name for a company making a game where you play as a spy who is famous for killing Russian spies. I was trying to look into it to see if like that's like a pseudonym for a different company, but I didn't spend that long looking because i was mostly playing the game i played the sega genesis version of the game it was also released on the master system and the game gear in the game you play as the timothy dalton version of james bond and i know it's the timothy dalton version because that's the one on the cover and also license to kill had just come out the game was four years after license to kill and a few years before goldeneye and in the game you run around and you save women who have been captured and you have to fight various bad guys most of them kind of look like mailmen with pistols uh in the game the controls are incredibly stiff so whenever you jump your character will kind of like fly through the air but then land very quickly there's like no momentum when you're jumping and there's also like no momentum when you're running so you'll be running like forward and then when you stop you pretty much just stop on a dime there's no like slight forward momentum that you get which is uh something you might get in like a mario game or a sonic game and other things that happen are like if your character gets shot you will fly backwards so if you're standing on the ledge and you will fly off the ledge you also take damage from falling so you can get shot and survive but die when you hit the ground classic james bond right there Uh, it's kind of a messy game it's it wasn't a very fun game uh, I played it because I've seen like the game sitting on store shelves and I was like, hey, I'll give it a shot. And yeah, I mean, it's a pre GoldenEye James Bond game. So like, really, what can you expect? To be honest, what can you expect out of any post GoldenEye James Bond games? They really hit it out of the park with one game and that was it. That's it. That's the only game that's worth playing. So Seth, what about you? What have you been playing? Recently, I've been playing uh, some more of Cyberpunk 2077. I'm pretty sure I've talked about Cyberpunk 2077 before on the podcast. Uh, it it was developed and published by CD Projekt Red. It's an open world action adventure RPG set in the dystopian future in a city called Night City. It's very dark, gritty. People have cyber mods. You know, like they have blades that come out of their arms. Their eyes are robot eyes. Some people are mechs. I enjoy it. Uh, it's a great game. I really like the first level um, a lot. And I have been actually trying to play through it to get farther than my previous character. When, when I originally played the game, I played a significant amount of it but got stuck into some really bad glitches where my only option was to like redo sections or restart it entirely so i did and then i played a little bit and was like i don't want to do this anymore so i put it down and so i'm coming back to it because i can now kind of also stream it onto my steam deck it actually streams pretty playable and when you stream to your steam deck it doesn't use as much power so i can either install the game and play it on my steam deck where it then the fan kicks on and it's like melting everything um but it runs it okay or i can stream it for a very similar performance and it uses a fraction of the battery and so it's actually a pretty good game to stream and i really wanted to experiment with it by streaming which is why i really started playing cyberpunk i was like oh i should see if i can stream it because it's a pretty intense graphically game and i want to like use it as a benchmark to how the streaming performance works and then ultimately was like yeah this is actually 
uh, I'm actually having some fun, so I'm going to keep playing it. So I have also gotten a new computer since I last played Cyberpunk, but I haven't played Cyberpunk on it. So I was playing Cyberpunk on it too, and it, it's, it runs really nice. It's I no complaints. I mean, there's occasional the random glitches that always kind of crop up in Cyberpunk where people do weird things or sound cuts out or something happens but so far it's been pretty good i'm uh i'm not even sure what play style i'm kind of going with a blade ninja type of like decker that uses like blades so like i'm doing like quick hacks and sneaking around and stabbing people but the last mission i just decided that uh, a shotgun was going to be more effective so i blasted through everybody with a shotgun so maybe i'll do that I don't know. It's cyberpunk, so you can kind of tweak your character as you play along. So, um, so far, I'm going to go, I'm going to try to do the blade stealthy quick hack build. But um, ultimately, if I end up just blasting people with shotguns, whatever is fun. That sounds good. In today's episode, we're going to take a departure from blasting people with anything because we're talking about a game that doesn't have a lot of violence in it it's a game that's a bit more subdued uh today we're talking about the sims uh seth do you have any anything you want to share do i have memories of sims i yeah. don't think we've had memory we didn't even talk about memories in mafia i don't think but man i do have some memories i'm a really big fan of the sims uh, our sister is actually a really good fan of the a big fan of the sims as well or at least the original sims because i think we own the original sims because of sarah and then i you've also are pretty good with the sims you like the sims i've played a bit of sims 2 i want to get back into the sims um and i will be probably playing sims 3 and sims 4 soon i played a lot of sims 1 sims 2 sims 3 and sims 4 i've also played a lot of all the expansions i probably have collected i want to say 70 to 80 percent of all the expansions for each of the sims right so like i think we had like 70 or 80 percent of the sims 1 expansion 70 80 percent of the sims 2 expansions i either have the complete sims 2 and then i have of most of the sims 3 collection and then i have a bunch of sims 4 stuff i don't have all of it for everything because especially when the sims 4 and we'll get into this uh later about them and their x packs but uh the sims 4 i just i'm not interested in all the things or it's just not that interesting enough for me to spend like 40 dollars on an expansion pack but the sims is cool right so i really enjoyed sim city and i also really enjoyed the other Maxis products that were coming out at that time. So it'd be like Sim City, Sim Park. I didn't play a lot of Sim Ant, but like I definitely played a lot of Sim Park. But I really enjoyed playing The Sims um, when it came out. It just so it had something, it was something special about the art, about the like the box art, the art style in the game, the music. The music is just so great. And we're we're gonna talk about the music a little bit as well. But my favorite character, and I have created him in every sim, his name is Mr. That's his first name, is Mr. And his last name is Paranormal. And he goes down any type of weird profession. And so in the first game, in Live in Large, there he this is where Mr. Paranormal came around was actually because of Living Large. In Living Large, Mr. Paranormal joined the Paranormal career path and at the top level of the Paranormal career path, you become a cult leader and you your character dresses in like a, like a Steve Jobs turtleneck and flies in a helicopter to work and he looked a little like Steve Jobs, the original Mr. Paranormal. He had glasses, like the, he had like horn rim glasses and he was like a little bit of a balding blonde man and he was kind of just in retrospect i really did design just steve jobs as a sim cult leader which i mean isn't too far from the truth <laughs> and mr paranormal has been recreated in all of the sims since then he has occasionally been a private eye <laughs> he's also done some other interesting things through his life because he can't always be a cult leader or maybe he is but I guarantee you in any iteration of any Sims game, even ones that are existing now, like if I open up a cloud save for my Sims 4 game or Sims 3 game, Mr. Paranormal will be there somewhere. <laughs> what about you, Zach? Do you have any memories of the uh, the old Sims? I remember just watching you play the Sims and I remember watching Sarah play the Sims. Just like designing the houses and just the characters interacting with each other and sometimes the house catching fire. Most of my memories come from the experience of watching one of you you guys play it 
Yeah, I think that's a, an aspect of The Sims that we can go into. But my really fond memories of as well is you spend so much time designing the house. Like you could spend so much time designing the house. You could spend so much time decorating the house. By the time you're actually ready to play, this happened to me more times than not. I would spend a lot of time designing my Sim, possibly designing a Sim family, designing their perfect house, possibly cheating to get a bunch of money to build the perfect house, filling it with the perfect amount of furniture placed in all the perfect spots and then by the time i was ready to hit play i was done i was done playing the sims <laughs> i was like over with it and i would never actually like play with the sims i would just do all the construction up until the sims and then i'd be like all right can't wait to play this later and never play it again yeah it seems like a lot of people will have played the sims and probably from what i've seen spent the majority of time doing exactly that just building the world and then being like oh that's six hours gone you know <laughs> i always turn aging off on my sims i think one day i'm gonna do that i'm gonna like actually play a game where i'm like these people are going to die like they're gonna age up and they're going to eventually pass away and that's how life works but until i finally do that i have never played a, the sims with aging turned on i would always force age people up because you could do that you buy a birthday cake and you could just force age your kid to be in different life stages but then they're in that life stage forever until you force age them again which is in retrospect, is kind of an interesting torture. I, I feel like The Sims, with all the AI stuff that's going on right now, I feel like The Sims, whatever Sims games come out in the future, is going to be really interesting. Yeah, I think so too. Now, to get into the story of The Sims, um, it's important to first talk about Will Wright. Will Wright was born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1960, and he was drawn to game design by playing the game Go, which uh, Will noted was a game that was both simple in its set of rules, but also also that quote strategies in it are so complex and as he got older he began to become more interested in games specifically complicated board games such as the war games produced by Avalon Hill. Now Will was a really smart guy he actually graduated from high school at the age of 16 and he went on to go study architecture at Louisiana State University. He later transferred to Louisiana Tech to study mechanical engineering and then he transferred again to the new school in New York City. And when he lived in New York he acquired an Apple II Plus computer and he began to teach himself applesoft basic pascal and assembly language in 1984 will developed and released his first game raid on bungling bay which was created for the commodore 64 and it was later ported to systems like the nes msx and even into the arcade raid on bungling bay is a shoot 'em up where you play as a helicopter and while developing it will found that he had the most fun when he was designing the cities and the environments that you explored versus the actual gameplay now from here Will will go on to create SimCity, but in order to publish SimCity, Will would team up with business executive Jeff Braun to found the company Maxis, which I mentioned earlier in the episode when we were talking about memories. Uh, SimCity would go on to sell very well and become a massive success for Maxis, which the game would release in 1989 and would quickly reach over a million copies sold by late 1992. It also won a variety of awards which helped put Maxis' name on the map and gave something to Maxis that it needed, and that was cash flow. And with cash flow, comes much opportunity cash flow and a successful brand that's right so now they just throw sim in front of everything and they were off to the races the success that sim city had was so impactful to gaming because it was able to intersect real world systems with video games now maxis would go on to acquire the company delta logic and rebrand them as maxis business simulations where they would go on to create sim refinery for chevrolet Ron and Sim Health for the Markle Foundation which both sound like games that I would play. Yeah, well, Sim Refinery was like considered lost because it was only available for Chevron employees. Oh. Sim Refinery is available. Um, it was discovered and dumped on archive.org. Sim Health, I think, was commercially available, but it's kind of an odd little game in that it's a simulation of the American healthcare system in the 1990s. Throughout the 90s, there were a variety of Sim games that were released, which include Sim Earth, which was not anything like Sim City. The child friendly sim town there was sim city 2000 and sim copter 
Simcopter. Now, Simcopter would would be the first sim game that would utilize the language of Simlish, which we will see it very soon. Now, 1991 tragedy would actually strike. The Oakland firestorm decimated around 1,500 acres, and with that, it consumed. 2,843 homes and 437 apartment and condos. All of them lost. Out of those 2,800 homes, Will Wright's house was one of them. After the fire, Will got to work on rebuilding and redesigning his house because he was a pretty smart dude. And while doing the work to get the house back together, he would do what any normal person would do and think, "Eh, I should make this a game. And Will began to develop an idea for a sim dollhouse. And he envisioned something similar to SimCity, but with the focus on the people of SimCity. SimCity, which, let's be real, SimCity died 10 years ago when they released it in 2013 and it bombed horribly. They have not released another SimCity since 2013 and they have yet to make a SimCity Sims game. There's yet to be a game where you could be in SimCity and then be in The Sims at the same time. Yeah. I feel like the capability is there and they've talked about it a lot and... I feel like The Sims was originally supposed to be kind of like a drill down on some city. However, nope, two entirely different franchises to this day, with one of them being pretty much kaput right now. In regards to Will, I think it's interesting, though, that um, this is kind of like a trend that I noticed when I was reading up on him when it comes to like doing something and then becoming more interested in like a certain element of it. So like when he was developing Raid on Bungling Bay, he was more interested in designing the levels. When his house burned down, he got really interested in redesigning his house. And later on, when he was working on Sims, he would get interested in like the way the AI worked. And it's kind of interesting to see how certain things will stand out to Will and that will become like the focus and i think that's a you know it's a good quality to have it probably helped really keep him on track and create the things he wanted to create will's first idea was a game called home tactics his plan was to have a game where you would design a home and the home would be rated based on the quality of life that the homeowners had and he wanted the players to focus on things like carpentry construction and landscaping a lot of the inspiration actually came from a book by christopher alexander called a pattern language which was about architecture and urban design will also reportedly was inspired by scott mcleod's understanding comics which in the book has a focus on the collaboration between a designer and a consumer. Will took this great idea and he pitched it to his friends at Maxis. And at the time, Maxis was a public company and they had been acquired by EA, so they had a board of directors and also EA was kind of heavily involved in Maxis's production stuff. So Will pitched it to the Maxis board and pitched it to some focus groups. No one liked the idea. <laughs> it was not an idea that people were really dedicated to. However, Electronic Arts knew that Will Wright had a knack for creating games and he knew and they knew that SimCity was a success so they allowed Will to work on the game between his time developing SimCity 2000 and SimCopter now he was allowed to bring at the time one programmer onto the project with them who would be Jamie Dornbus. Will and Jamie were the main developers for the first few years and worked on developing a system for character behavior Will took a liking to the system and he found the social parts of the game were almost just as interesting as the house design parts which was where he came up with the idea in the game for the first place but he really liked the idea that the sims would communicate with each other and he also liked the ability for a sim to decide to visit another sim at their own leisure will would also pull some inspiration from little computer people a 1985 computer game that was set in a cross-section view of a three-story house where the player must interact with various people and observe how they socialize he actually apparently reached out to one of the developers of little computer people and was able to get some feedback that helped inform his work on The Sims. As the game began to take shape, more programmers and artists would begin joining the project. Uh, Will would implement Simlish, which was created originally for Simcopter, into the game for the characters to speak. Simlish is a constructed language that was primarily created to avoid repetitive dialogue and cut down on the cost of translating. Simlish is a nonsense language with no real structure. Uh, This was done intentionally, as Will noticed that hearing a voice speaking gibberish sounds less repetitive than hearing a voice speak an actual language. The only simlish phrase with an actual definition is susul, which is goodbye. 
so so. Will thinking about ultimately translating and trying to keep translation costs down and all of that is a theme for him because he likes to make sure that his game can sell everywhere. And that theme will come up again later. The game also briefly went under the name Dollhouse, but this would be eventually changed to The Sims, reportedly to distance from the connection that dolls are associated as toys for girls, and also to better associate the game with the other games in The Sims brand. The music for the game was composed by Jerry Martin, Mark Russo, Kirk R. Casey, and Dix Bruce. It has a World of Tomorrow, mid-20th century Americana vibe to it. It's very catchy. It's also very catchy no matter where you are. And part of the reason for the Americana tunes is to make the game more portable to other countries. If you have a, a catchy tune that's catchy everywhere and there's a language that's you don't need to translate the game. You only need to translate the text. You don't really actually have to localize it. Yeah. Which saves a lot of money because everywhere, everywhere in this world, there are people who build houses and go to work. <laughs> I don't think there's a single place where there is not a place where people build, don't build houses and go to work. That's pretty much the structure of humanity. A demo of the game was presented at E3 in 1999. During the presentation, the game showed two female characters attending a wedding, fall in love, and and then kiss each other. According, now this is 1999 folks, according to some sources, this wasn't planned. However, one of the programmers, Patrick Barrett, was asked to put together the demo and ran out of time to create a pre-programmed event. So he just dropped a bunch of sims into a wedding and the two female characters fell in love by themselves. Yes, and kissed when the press was watching the demo. Yes. While the team was surprised that this happened, it was the talk of the expo because once again, it was 1999. So like, this was not uh this was bucking the norm as it were now the sims would go on to be released in february of 2000 yes to talk about the gameplay of the sims uh it's i'm going to stick to general terms because the gameplay of the sims is just very different from that of any other game out there you build a house you create your sim and you let them live their life uh this involves guiding them to get a job making sure they eat having them meet friends having them enter relationships and so on and you do this all through like almost like suggesting things to the sim they'll indicate they're hungry using like a status indicator and you'll kind of like click on them and suggest that they go to the fridge and your sims can like not do that isn't there like times where your sim just refuses to do something so the sims and every sims edition has had this where you have the free will indicator yes and every sim games has the ability to turn free will on and turn free will off you can also have limited free will and or full free will so uh full free will they will you don't have to do anything they will go and do everything themselves and they will generally try to take care of themselves. You have to give them the things to do in order to take care of themselves, but they will do it themselves. So if you ever wanted to just watch a game be played without actually playing it, you could just max your free will out and call it a day. Uh, limited free will, they will generally take care of basic needs, but they won't enrich themselves by themselves. So like they'll pee when they need to pee, but they won't necessarily like r become better at logic to progress their career, which is that's a limited free will. And then no free will is they'll just stand there and not do anything until you tell them to do it and that includes dying i always play with no free will uh i like to micromanage my sims there is also the ability and i think this is in the original but there was also the ability to turn on limited free will based on the sim selected so like if you had a family of five you could have max free will on all of the family except for the sim that you're selected they would and also with free will your commands always override the commands that the sim generates themselves now um sims would have an indicator that would be placed over their head in neutral state it's like a green diamond shape it was actually apparently a placeholder texture and then it just kind of stuck and this will actually change color and stuff to indicate certain moods so it'd be like red if they're angry or if something negatively is impacting the sim so that's a quick way to kind of get a status on your sim if you see them no longer be green now when you craft your sim you can balance 
enhance their various social attributes. Uh, so like you can make them neat, outgoing, active, less active, whether or not they're playful or even if they're just nice. Um, so you really have free reign on how your sim behaves. And you could also have your sim die, whether it's by accident or through old age. So they could just get old and pass away or they could start a fire in their house and not know how to work the fire extinguisher. Or you could purposely kill your sim, like starting a fire in the house and hiding the fire extinguisher. <laughs> or removing the ladder when they enter the swimming pool. The world is your oyster in The Sims. You cannot actually hide the fire extinguisher. All Sims have a magic fire extinguisher on them at all times. However, you can set a a bunch of the like very flammable objects and then you can make a, a fire that they cannot beat. I actually, there's something that I want to mention before we get into it, into the, the numbers and the expansions and stuff like that. There was a huge trade in The Sims community for modding the sims is a heavily heavily even today heavily modded or even just workshopped game where people would design clothing equipment cars anything and everything you could think of you could have as items in the in the game to the point where i had a house that had boba fett darth vader elvis presley and, and somebody else all of in the same house and Elvis fell in love with Darth Vader or something had happened and Darth Vader had a secret room that was the escape room and it was full of flammable objects and a a firework and when they wanted to escape from the police or something they could run through light the firework and the entire house would burn down and that was in the the original sims oh I want to say it was a Gundam Wing or something was the last guy. Yes, it was. It, it was, was a Gundam. It was a Gundam. Yeah. It was a Gundam. That's right. It was it was Darth Vader, Boba Fett, Elvis Presley, and a Gundam. <laughs> And they all lived together. And Darth Vader and Boba Fett were in love. And then he cheated on Elvis. Something happened. But uh, yeah, it was a it was a great it was a great house. And it was doable because of the multiple Sim websites where you could download Sim stuff. There was like a one that was like the Sim Depot or something, and it was like a mall of like. And it was like the website had like a picture of like a, a shopping center, and you can click on different places to buy. Like you go to the clothes store to download clothes, or you go to the furniture store to download furniture yeah right and it's still today you could download stuff for like you can mod the sims any of the sims you could just mod and they're surprisingly for it being an ea game the game is actually very easy to mod there is a section in the game that says do you want to enable mods and you click yes and then you just put them in a mod folder and that's all you have to do except you have to maintain them because the sims updates regularly and breaks mods so you have to maintain your mods but you could go crazy with mods and what's cool is that the sims doesn't really have like achievements there's it's such a open-ended game that there really isn't any goals except for goals that you put yourself so i don't feel bad about modding it because sometimes i don't mod games like fallout because it's going to disable achievements and i like to get achievements but i don't but i want to mod the game in even a quality of life mod makes it so that achievements get disabled which makes me really mad but the sims i don't care i'm i mod the heck out of it <laughs> i think i run like six or seven mods on it at a time now in regards to the numbers the sims the original sims game it was a smash hit the game was also unique because it was universally popular not only with men but also with women which was really for that time a thing like being popular with women was uh, a market that was very under tapped and having the sims be able to tap that market and also still maintain like share with the men audience was something that it was just like a, a game that everyone liked it and it was even rated e and people who bought mature games were like yeah i'll play, I'll play the sims like everyone played the sims it was great on release the game sold very well quickly becoming one of the best selling games of 2000 with domestic sales at 1.7 million units and revenues of about $72.9 million. The game remained at number one through 2001, and by 2002, it was one of the best-selling games of all times, selling more than 6.3 million copies worldwide. As of 2015, the game had sold 11.24 million units. The game was also critically popular, getting a 9.1 out of 10 from GameSpot, 9.5 out of 10 from IGN, and 5 stars from GamePro. 
and five stars from all game. And that's not all. They would go on to release expansion packs, and we're not going to bore you with the numbers of all the expansion packs. However, live and large, the first expansion pack would go on to sell 595,410 units in the back half of 2000. It was released in August, and by the end of the year, it sold over a half a million units, and would go on to sell another 818,000 units in 2001 alone. It would be the U.S. sixth highest selling computer game in 2001, and it was an expansion pack. So The Sims were on the highest selling computer games in 2001 for The Sims and for its expansion pack. And then people are like, why do The Sims have so many expansion packs? I'll tell you why. Because of money. And this would pave the way for The Sims company, whoever owns it, currently EA, but at the time even Maxis, to realize they could make a boatload of money by just releasing expansions to their game. Now, does this take away from the original version of the game? I would say in Sims 1, maybe Sims 2, no, I think the original version of the game can stand alone. Sims 3, Sims 4 maybe could require some expansion packs to round it out. We'll see with Sims 5 what they plan on doing with that. But I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying if you're wondering where all this DLC push came from in 2023, it's probably because of Max is over there raking in $100 million from releasing a game with an expansion expansion pack yeah as with great sales comes great sequels and expansion packs and boy howdy does sims have expansion packs the first game alone had seven official expansion packs live in large house party hot date vacation unleashed superstar and making magic let's break them all down live in large was the first expansion pack ever for the sim series um something that very shortly would no longer be a unique experience because there would be a lot of expansion packs but it would introduce things like a character named Servo, who was a robot butler, a very sad, tragic clown, the Grim Reaper, and also like a genie. Live and Large would also go on to introduce a variety of new items, clothing, a more of a neighborhood, and more careers, including one of our favorites, the paranormal career, where at the top, you can become a cult leader and take a helicopter to work. Also, there was a hacker career, which is the only time their hacker career is featured in the entire franchise also the tragic clown shows up when you're really sad <laughs> just just, just makes you know. things worse He's also this is a little bit of living large but also with the sims in the sims one you commute to work with somebody else who comes to pick you up and the car gets better the more advanced you are in the career and it happens in the sims 2 as well and it's so funny seeing your sims at the beginning of their career climb into like this like crappy car and then eventually becomes like a limo a helicopter or some like really fancy vehicle i just think it's really funny fun in regards to seeing that but yeah i'm a big fan of living large the next expansion would be house party house party introduced the ability to throw parties at your house if you threw a good enough party then drew carey would show up and tell you that he had a really fun time at the party there were no new careers but you got some new objects and npcs that were added included uh dancers that came out of cake they were either a sexy male or sexy female who would flirt with your sims unless there are children present then it's a a gorilla who does not flirt with your sims and yeah drew carey shows up if it's a good party if it's a bad party the opposite of drew carey shows up <laughs> which apparently is a mime <laughs> <laughs> it is a mime. a mime is the opposite of drew carey next up comes a uh, hot date the third expansion pack that now allows your character to go to a place that is not your home nor other people's homes it allows you to go to places that are neither of those and that's the new neighborhood of downtown this also uh this one also did not include new careers however it did introduce new features such as new interactions, the ability to have a lifetime relationship bar, and new interests along with some new objects and new NPCs such as random town folks, also known as townies, who are people that wander downtown and you can talk to. Also, wait staff at restaurants, a wandering minstrel. Also, there's Claire the bear, who is either a bear or a person that's dressed as a bear who rummages through your trash. And there's also 
Miss Crumplebottom, who beats people up with her purse if they have if they display any public affection affection in downtown. So if you're outside and you're having a date and you're on the park bench and you try to kiss your love in front of Miss Crumplebottom, she will beat the crap out of you. Miss Crumplebottom will also become a reoccurring NPC in later Sims games. In Sims Vacation, uh, so we actually owned Sims Vacation. I really liked Sims Vacation. We also owned Hot Date. We also owned House Party, and we also owned Live in Large. Pretty sure the only Sims game, the original Sims expansion, was Superstar that we didn't own. We owned um, Making Magic as well. In Sims Vacation, you are able to travel to new area called vacation island and there was actually like three different sub areas in vacation island but you could take your sim on a relaxing trip with your family and not only did this introduce the vacation island but which had distinct environments such as the beach the forest and the snowy mountains the areas also had their own mascot a hammerhead shark for the beach an archer for the forest and a yeti for the mountain it was also the first time your sim could take vacation period in previous games Games, your character worked whatever their shift was every day with no ability to take time off except for calling out sick or not showing up which you could only do like once or twice you could no show like twice and you wouldn't get fired even if you were at the top of your career so you could be the ceo of a company or like a cult leader or a general of the army and if you didn't show up to work three times your ass was grass <laughs> however with vacation you could plan a vacation time where you take up to like it was like three to ten days off and you would go to the uh resort i really liked the snow resort i thought that was really fun there was actually this was the time period where there was so machinima was kind of on the rise at this time where people would take would they, where people would create art with video games and one of the first interactions with some it wasn't actually machinima but it was like a sim, machin, machinima type of like variant that I really got into was there were people that made comics with screenshots from the sims and they introduced entire storylines and characters of these people and would write the dialogue that their sims were Oh, having yeah and i remember they seeing would... some of those yeah <laughs> yeah and we're not talking about just like memes we're talking about like hundreds of images of these of these people exploring and the one memory that i have beyond owning the the snow the vacation the vacation expansion pack was i remember really being involved with a sim comic series and them going on vacation to the mountains and like them being like hey we're here at the mountain resort and taking pictures of the inside of the design because this it added a uniqueness because the comic designer could des you could design all of the different locations you could design your downtown restaurants if you had hot date you could design your own ski resort if you had the vacations it, you didn't just have to use stock locations so you could design these and then you could take photographs within your design locations and you could use that to tell stories which was really cool and just a facet of the sims i think it still happens but like it's just there's something about it that just is like it just led into like this whole grouping of like sim stuff that was going on that was just awesome the expansion that pack that came after that was unleashed where you now could have cats and dogs. Uh, so if you thought taking care of humans was hard, now you have to take care of humans who take care of animals. Smaller pets like fish, birds, and lizards were also introduced. Pets could be trained to obey their sims, and you could enter them into a local pet show. They were great. I loved pets, and because they made Unleashed, every Sims game afterwards, people were always like, when are you releasing pets? <laughs> Just like, when are, you, when are you making the pets? And all of the future Sims games have had pets expansions, which like, you know what? Prop on Maxis slash EA to just never implement pets into the base game because they know for a fact people will buy which like sims expansion packs msrp like sims 4 40 dollars <laughs> and i think they finally put sims 4 to free to play so you could play the base game for free yeah but th they did originally sell that game for 50 
or yeah. 60. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're paying $40 for MSRP for an expansion pack, $20 for like a stuff pack, and they could just print money over there. I mean, they obviously, there's an expense, right? They have to have designers go in and create the assets and get everything to work. But ultimately, they only have to do that once. Also, there is themes with the macro versions of The Sims. As we just mentioned, they always release like a pets expansion pack. There's always some sort of like theme around these almost like there's like Zach's going to talk about Superstar there's sometimes a fame theme there's like uh, there's usually a theme around vacations or weather or something like that and just like it's just university became a popular theme they didn't do one they didn't do a university for Sims 1 but they did start doing university with later expansion or later Sims games and those you would see those university expansions off of like Sims 2 would have them Sims 3 would have them Sims 4 would have it they would read they repeat expansions that sell very very well right now superstar would be the sixth expansion pack and this would allow your sim to become famous introduced were some new npcs like avril levine andy warhol christina aguilera marilyn monroe john bon jovi freddie prince jr sarah mclaughlin and reese witherspoon's character l woods from legally blonde along with other just like non-famous npcs like obsessed fan or like paparazzi man i i love that these npcs are like trapped in a t- specific time so it's like npcs that were famous people from that time period and then like andy warhol and marilyn monroe <laughs> but like like yeah freddie prince jr like avril lavigne christina Aguilera these are all big names still today but these 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 were stars that were at top of their game in the early 2000s this was like uh, these were big names for that period this expansion pack also marks the first time where a player would be able to see their sim at work probably because the entire expansion pack was about them working um, some of the new careers included supermodel actor or singer now the final expansion pack for this original sims was make and magic which was released in 2003 and is also the last expansion pack to support Windows 95. This pack uh, introduced more NPCs, and uh, this includes Bone Hilda and Mystery Man, and also new objects such as a spooky laboratory and a hole in the ground, which will let you escape to Magic Town, a place where magic was everywhere. Your character can now also cast magic charms and spells, and you can get a dragon as a pet. If you have Unleashed installed, you can turn your pet into a sim. Yeah, which is just hilarious. Hilarious. I wish that it was also, I wish it was a temporary turn in so that like you'd be like, you could turn your cat into a sim, but only for three days. <laughs> now a sequel to The Sims, the base game, Sims 2 would be released in 2004 and would go on to receive eight expansion packs of its own. Uh, university, Nightlife, Open for Business, Pets, Seasons, Bond, Voyage, Free Time, and Apartment Life. And you can already feel the similarities that it had with the original expansion packs, including Nightlife, Hot Day, come on, it's the same ga- it's the same expansion pack except they're maybe they're not releasing the cages that there were in the sims 1 i have really clear distinct memories of the sims 1 i know i owned and played a lot of sims 2 and 3 equally those games kind of run together for me i'm like i definitely played a lot of sims 2 i also played a lot of sims 3 sometimes i'm thinking about a memory i'm like is that sims 2 or is that sims 3 however sims 3 2009 would go on to then have 11 expansion packs in its own right and Finally, the current iteration of The Sims is The Sims 4, which has gone on to have 12 expansion packs so far and 12 game packs, which are not expansion packs. So that's 24 different expanded packs. So if Sims 5 is going to come out, it's going to have like 40 expansion packs. Good luck. It's going to be it's going to be great, though. Uh, I'm going to waste so much money on them. Beyond this, there was also a variety of spinoffs from The Sims, such as Sims Online, The Sims Social, The Sims stories the sims carnivals and sims medieval and of course various different console ports I did not play a lot of Sims spinoff games. However, I did own Sims Medieval, and that's a lot of fun. That game is also weird because it is not a traditional Sims game, and I feel like this is the episode that we need to talk about Sims Medieval because we can't talk about it by itself. Sims Medieval is strange because you play as characters that are given quests that they have to accomplish, and they all have stories. So you could play as the king, and you need to do like XYZ tasks every day, and you need to manage your kingdom. You 
you need to like you can do some manipulation of your castle but you can't design your own castle you have to just you design your own rooms but they have like they're like different classes and then you get introduced to new classes and then you have to go and create those new classes and they get entered into your medieval kingdom so they'll interact with your sim who is also the king and then you will play the assassin who then has to kill the king no <laughs> but they essentially have their own storylines and it's vastly different than the sims so if you like the medieval era and you like the sims sims medieval might be up your alley um just know that you can't design your own castle from the grounds up if you think it's going to be that it's not going to be that it's going to be a sh- more structured story and finally a movie a sims movie was also planned and written by brian lynch it was going to be produced by john davis and the rights for the movie were purchased by 20th century fox in 2007 so it was going to come out however the film fell into development hell and in 2019 when disney acquired 21st century fox they said that's not happening and it was canceled and that's the sims uh we're gonna move on to the retro rewind section zach had me playing dick tracy for the sega genesis released in 1991 it was developed by the sega technical institute and is a side-scrolling action arcade game where you control dick tracy dick tracy has a bright yellow trench coat and if he didn't have it it could be just a mob game since dick tracy is equipped with not his special watch no That is not what he's equipped with. He does not fight bad guys with his watch. He fights them with a gun. And he has a backup gun. So the A button shoots his pistol. And that shoots it left to right. The C button shoots his Tommy gun. And that shoots it like a gallery style into the background. And then you the B button jumps. The game is a very interesting take on a gallery shooter. Kind of like Sunset Riders that I had Zach play earlier. Mm -hmm. Except not only are there people in the background. There's also people in the foreground. Which I actually think Sunset Riders has people in the foreground so maybe that's the wrong answer but i think sunset riders you can use the same gun to shoot the people in the foreground as well as the background no no dick tracy you have to use your pistol to shoot the people in front of you and the tommy gun for the people in the background the this game did not sell well it actually released eight months after the movie dick tracy came out and two months after the movie hit vhs and i say this because it is the reason that sega would go on to insist being part of any movie-based projects a year in advance of the movie because they know that their sales dipped because nobody cared about Dick Tracy when it came out. However, for being only done in five months, they did a pretty good job. It The game is pretty fun. I enjoyed myself. Um, I definitely recommend it if you like a good gallery shooter that has a, a spin on the gallery where you have like other aspects of the game to, to take care of and it, it holds up pretty well. For next week, Zach, I think I want you to play Mercs for the Sega Mega Drive. Sounds good. Seth had me play R-Type for the arcade. It was released in 1987 by Irem, and it's a horizontal shooter. It's pretty darn fun. The game has uh, beautiful 16-bit graphics, great music, and it's also one of those horizontal shooters that I think is just incredibly satisfying uh, in the sense that when you, like, are shooting and blasting enemies, there's just a good feel about it. You know, it just feels like everything clicks. You play as a spaceship, and you shoot other spaceships and, like, aliens and stuff. Uh, your default weapon is kind of a weak, rapid-fire main gun but you can charge this to blast a more powerful wave cannon which will actually plow through a bunch of enemies this allows you to have a balance between timing your more powerful shots to deal with the larger enemies you encounter or using the weaker shots to deal with the weaker enemies sometimes there are larger enemies on the screen and weaker enemies coming at you at the same time so it might be a very fast bit of timing that you have to do to make sure that you are getting rid of everything appropriately it's a fun game it's a kind of a hard game as it's one of those games where you get hit once and you're dead but overall i liked it and i will happily revisit it though i might play it on like a console next time next week seth you can play undercover cops uh, and you can play either the arcade or the super famicom version as i don't know how much of a difference there is okay okay. well thank you everyone for listening to us if you have any memories of the sims or you want to tell us anything else you can email us at classic gaming brothers at gmail.com you can also reach out to us via our website classic gaming brothers.com we are available on twitch classic gaming brothers facebook classic gaming brothers instagram classic gaming brothers or twitter cg brothers pod and uh be sure to like like, subscribe, let us know how much you love this podcast, and be sure to let your friends know that we're available on all the podcasting applications. As a 
friendly reminder. The last weekend of this month, March, Seth and I will be at PAX East and we're hoping to have a good time at PAX East, I assume. Uh, so uh, if you are there, let us know. We'll be happily, we'll happily meet up with you. And if you want to hang out with us, let us know. Uh, we love running into our fans. That being said, Seth, is there anything I'm forgetting? Don't play games like my brother. And don't play games like my brother. I've been Seth. And I've been Zach. And we've been the classic gaming brother. That's, That's right. right.